Very well, let us both learn together. All things can be conjoined. The Academy of Raya Lucaria, the Carian Royal Family, the Three Fingers, the Godskin Apostles, Celia, the Town of Sorcery, the Snow Witch, the Fire Monks, the Fundamentalists, and the Two Fingers. Each of them follow their own beliefs and values in the same way that each of them have created their own version of power. We do not pick one or the other, instead we take from them all. Combining the advantages of each of these groups and beliefs, we achieve true power. This is the Syncretist, a knight who understands that understanding is the true path to success. This is a build for all of those players that want to have as many options as Elden Ring gives them. Sorceries and incantations, offense and defense, physical damage as well as fire, magic, lightning or holy. Nothing is forbidden and everything is permitted. As always, we will review the stats of this build, the equipment that we use and of course its applications within the game. Since there is a lot of ground to cover, I have created timestamps in the description of this video in order to make it easier to navigate the content and give you the opportunity to skip straight to the part that interests you the most. Let's get started. This is a PvE focused build that works well in both solo and jolly cooperation. When creating this build, I had one single objective and that is to give the player as many options as I could in order to maximize their choices, their possibilities, and their agency. Through the capability of casting almost any spell in the game, the player can choose to be a Lightning Lord, a Pyromancer, a Melee Mage, and everything else in between. This is done while also maximizing the comfort of the build. With a large HP pool, high defenses, and plenty of FP, this build is prepared to be whatever kind of sorcerer you want. The different damage types that we have accessible will make sure that you are never bothered by enemy resistances, and the sheer amount of options in sorceries and incantations will make sure that you are prepared for both ranged and close quarters combat. There are so many ways to play this build that it will take hours to go over them all. I will show you what I like to do, but honestly, be ready to find your true passion. To reach this objective, we will be running the following stats. Start the game as an Astrologer. This class is the most efficient to reach the required stat block for this build, allowing us to make use of every rune level possible to its maximum potential. As the primary focus of this build is PvE, I have chosen to base it on rune level 150. Finally, this is the stats block that you want to end up with. 59 Vigor, plus 1 from the Crimson Hood for a total of 60. 31 Mind. 10 Endurance, 8 Strength, 12 Dexterity, 50 Intelligence, 50 Faith, and 9 Arcane. There are many ways to reach these stats. Level up however you feel comfortable. That said, I do recommend that you take the following path. As soon as you are in the lands between, the first thing to do is get your Vigor to 20. Survivability is more important than damage when you're just starting out a character. The second priority is to get some tools for the character. In this case, we are interested in bringing Endurance to 10 and Faith to 12. This will give us access to a basic set of incantations to mix with our starting sorceries. The third priority will be to get Intelligence to 30. I like to level up Intelligence first in order to gain some power from sorceries and to get some good damage out of Magic, Affinity, Ashes of War. The fourth priority is to get Vigor to 40. This will allow you to survive comfortably throughout the mid-game, allowing you to focus on your other stats. The fifth priority is to get Intelligence to 50. At this time, you will have access to most sorceries and we will be able to use them at a very good potential. This will give us good damage on our offensive spells and magic affinity, Ashes of War. The sixth priority is to get Mind to 31. With the ability to cast better sorceries, we will need to have more FP in order to be able to deal high amounts of damage for a prolonged period of time. A higher mind keeps the DPS of the character consistent. The seventh priority is to top off Vigor at 59. This will put you at our required HP pool, granting you the maximum security to withstand the hardest hitting attacks from the endgame enemies. Remember that in this build, I am using the Crimson Hood for the plus one Vigor. This will max it at the soft cap of 60. If you choose to not use the Crimson Hood, drop mine to 30 and bring Vigor up to 60. 
the eighth and final priority is to max out Faith at 50. Up to this point we have built the character like a mage. Now we will have the full power of incantations also unlocked. We can take advantage of hybrids, staffs and seals as well as a combination of many different spells. So, why do we want these final stats? Allow me to explain. Vigor at 60 because I believe it is the perfect amount of health to survive the hardest hitting attacks of PvE. This will give us a total of 1900 base HP. It is a second cap for the stat. Going any higher really diminishes your returns. And honestly, I never go any lower. Mind at 31 because this build is a caster build. We focus on combining sorceries and incantations in order to always have the upper hand in battle. This requires a lot of FP, and as such, we will need a lot of mind. Endurance at 10 because it is the exact level that I need in order to use the weapons, armor, and talismans that I chose for this build. This has been perfectly min-maxed. If you go any lower, you lose the build. If you go any higher, you're wasting points. Strength at 8 because it is the base level of the Astrologer. It is already enough to use my weapon of choice. As such, we do not need to level this up at all. Dexterity at 12 because it is the base level of the Astrologer. It is already enough to use my weapon of choice. As such, we do not need to level this up at all. Intelligence at 50 because it is one of the primary stats of the build. This stat is needed in order to meet the requirements for the sorceries that we use. Also, it is one of our main sources of damage scaling for both our chosen sorcery staff and incantation seal. Faith at 50, because it is one of the primary stats of the build. This stat is needed in order to meet the requirements for the incantations that we use. Also, it is one of our main sources of damage scaling for both our chosen sorcery staff and incantation seal. Finally, Arcane at 9, because it is the base level of the Astrologer. We do not increase it at all in this build. Moving on to the equipment, this is the basic layout of the build. I wanted to make a character that could perform both in melee and ranged combat while seamlessly combining sorceries and incantations to obtain different effects. Sometimes we need damage, but other times we want a knockdown or a stance break. This setup lets us use exactly what we need. Starting with the main hand, we will be using the Noble Slender Sword and the Golden Order Seal. The Noble Slender Sword is the absolute perfect weapon for this build. With only 8 strength and 11 dexterity requirements, we are able to use it without spending a single point into stats. Being a member of the Straight Sword family, it has a fantastic moveset and speed, which is rounded out with the perfect Poke R2. Not only that, but it is the Straight Sword with the longest reach in the game. This makes it a fantastic choice for any build, but perfect for all mages. In regards to his Ash of War, I enjoy using the Glintstone Phalanx. I prefer this Ash of War for two reasons. First, it is cheap to use, at only 10 FP per cast. And second, these glint blades that it produces are monsters at breaking stances. The amount of stance damage that this Ash of War does is tremendous. Most regular enemies will have their stance broken immediately, and some of the larger enemies will only be one or two hits away. In regards to the affinity, I prefer to use the magic affinity. This affinity gives us the most AR possible, and it is natural to use with my choice of Ash of War. That said, this build perfectly supports the sacred and flame art affinities too. This means that if you prefer to use any other Ash of War, like Flame of the Red Mains, for example, you would be able to switch this weapon to fire damage instead. You would not lose much damage potential either. One of the biggest pros of this weapon is the option to change its damage type at every Sight of Grace. Also in the main hand, I choose to use the Golden Order Seal. This is the best seal in the game for the stats that the build uses. It provides us with the highest incantation possible and it weighs 0, 0.0 units, meaning that we get maximum power at no equip load cost. When it comes to hybrid casters, there is no superior choice for incantations. The Golden Order seal is simply the best. Moving on to our offhand, I like to use two armaments here, the Gelmir Glintstone Staff and the Frenzied Flame Seal. Starting with the Gelmir Glintstone Staff, this is one of the two options that we have for hybrid staffs that scale with intelligence and faith. 
The other option is the Prince of Death staff. At our current stats of 50 Int and 50 Faith, the Prince of Death staff has the best sorcery scaling at 286 points. That said, the Gelmir Glinstone staff has a sorcery scaling of 285. Yes, it is only one point behind. Since that makes them virtually the same, I chose to go with the Gelmir staff because I think it looks cool and it fits the fashion of the build better. But honestly, they are the same, so choose what you prefer. The other armament in the offhand is the Frenzied Flame Seal. Now, my dear viewer, this is very important because it is a key component in increasing the damage of this build. I use the Frenzied Flame Seal because it increases the damage of the Frenzied Flame incantations by 20%. And these are the incantations that I chose for this build to deal damage. The question is, if I am already using the Golden Order Seal, then why am I adding the Frenzied Flame Seal? In Elden Ring, when you have incantation seals or sorcery staffs that increase the damage of a specific school of spells, you do not need to cast the spell with that specific tool, you just need to have it out on your character. For the purposes of this build, when I cast incantations, I have the Golden Order seal in the main hand and the Frenzied Flame seal in the off hand. I cast the incantations with the Golden Order seal, which has the highest incantation scaling, but I still get the 20% extra damage on my Frenzied Flame incantations because I have the Frenzied Flame seal out in my off hand. This way, we can get maximum damage potential. Now, my dear viewer, this means that you can switch the Frenzied Flame Seal out for any other seal that increases the damage of the incantations that you can use. Do you want to use Bestial Incantations? Then you put the Clawmark Seal in your offhand. Do you want to use Godslayer Incantations? Then put the Godslayer Seal in your offhand. So on and so forth. Most offensive incantations have a special seal that increases their damage. So make sure that you match your offhand seal with the type of incantations that you want to use. Remember, cast the incantation with the Golden Order seal in your main hand, but keep the other seal out in the offhand to get a big boost of damage. One more thing about this. Some seals, like the Frenzied Flame seal, have no weight, 0.0 units. Other seals have a little bit of weight, 1.5 units. This build is extremely min-maxed when it comes to weight, so please pay attention. This piece of armor right here is the Royal Knight Gauntlets that we get from defeating Loretta in the Halic Tree. If you use a seal in your offhand that has 0.0, .0 units of weight, you use these gauntlets. Now, if you choose to use a seal in your offhand that weighs 1.5 units, then that would force you to move on to a heavy load. This is no good. So, in this case, you will switch the Royal Knight Gauntlets for the Landel Knight Gauntlets. This will allow you to use a seal with 1.5 units of weight while maintaining a medium load and, most importantly, while still fitting the fashion of the build. Obviously, this is what I do in order to fit this fashion. That said, if you, my dear viewer, choose a different fashion, then you will have to deal with the equip load yourself. The important thing to do is to always remember to match your offhand seal with the type of offensive incantations that you like to use. Take advantage of the extra damage. With our weapons out of the way, let's talk about talismans. This build has a very simple objective when it comes to talismans. I want to use talismans in order to increase the comfort of the build. This means providing more health, more defense, and more FP in order to keep options open and to allow the player to experiment with different tactics. This will let you make more mistakes without dying, and it will let you cast more spells before needing to refill your FP bar. It is an important part of the build to be able to have more player agency. For this reason, we are running the Erdtree Favor Plus 2, the Crimson Amber Medallion Plus 2, and the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman to be able to maximize our defensive potential, alongside the Cerulean Amber Medallion Plus 2 in order to increase our maximum FP and provide us with more spellcasting opportunities. Altogether, this talisman setup gives us a total of 2,134 HP, with a very solid 39% physical damage reduction, 
as well as a total FP of 198 points. As you can see, we have a lot of HP with a lot of defense and a lot of FP, which will give this build the chance to take a few more hits and sling a few more spells. Alright, let's talk about armor. In this game, armor is extremely important. This is because this game has extremely good looking armor. Fashion Souls or Elden Bling, however you prefer to call it, is at an all time high. For this build, I was looking to create a knight that has obviously gone through a life filled with education. Studying all of those different schools of spells definitely takes time and money. I wanted to express that through the combination of both steel and gold armor, using a blue base with red details. This is achieved with the Crimson Hood, the Carrion Knight Chest, the Royal Knight Gauntlets, and the Royal Knight Legs. The weapons that I chose for this build bring it all together. Remember, if you decide to use an offhand seal that weighs 1.5 units, you will need to switch the Royal Knight Gauntlets for the Landel Knight Gauntlets. They are a bit lighter and they keep the spirit of the fashion. All in all, this armor setup gives us a total of 24% physical damage reduction that can be increased to 39% physical damage reduction thanks to the Dragon Crest Grey Shield Talisman. As for poise, this build provides a total of 27 points of it, which is not very useful, but it can come in handy versus the lightest of attacks. As usual, since this is a PvE build, I did not really focus on poise and preferred to go for the looks and feel of the fashion instead. If we're gonna talk about the spirit summon, then the first thing to note is that this build can take advantage of any of the summons in the game. Thanks to the high HP and FP that it provides, you are free to pay any cost for the spirit summons and still be fully capable and fit for battle. This means that you can use whatever summon is your favorite. Really, just have fun with it. For me, I will always use the Mimic in most cases. Taking into consideration that it copies the build that I make, I really cannot overlook the power of this summon. With this build, you actually have access to multiple kinds of Mimics. Allow me to explain. When you summon the Mimic, it appears with the equipment that you currently have out on your character. One main hand armament, one off hand armament, and whatever consumables you have equipped to your belt. For this build specifically, that means that we can actually choose between a melee mimic and a caster mimic. What do I mean? Well, if you choose to summon the mimic with the noble slender sword on your main hand and the Gelmir glenstone staff on your off hand, then your mimic will have access to the sorceries that you equipped and the sword that you use. In my case, this means a lot of melee sorceries and a straight sword with glint blade phalanx. This mimic will get into the fray with me, providing knockdowns, AoEs, and a lot of stance damage, which in turn gives me chances for critical hits. On the other hand, this build can also summon the mimic with the Golden Order seal on the right hand and the Gelmir Glintstone staff on the left. This is the full caster mimic, and it has access to close range sorceries as well as long range incantation. It also has access to support spells. Essentially, it will be able to use any spell that you have equipped for both damage and support. This means that it probably won't be too close to the enemy to help you tank, but you will definitely notice all of the damage it can provide from range. With this many choices and options, we will be able to summon a mimic that fits our needs perfectly. The melee mimic, range mimic, caster mimic, support mimic, whatever mimic. It is there, waiting for your call. Up to this point, we have spoken about the equipment and the armor. We have talked about offense and defense. Up next, we need to talk about the different sorceries and incantations that I use in order to get the best value from this build. Now, before we begin, it is important that you, my dear viewer, understand that spell choice is 100% personal. The list of spells that I will show you here is not the absolute best list that you can have. Instead, these are the spells that I prefer to use because they are the ones that suit my playstyle the most. You may think that other spells are better, or that I am making the wrong choices. This is okay. Please remember to use any spell that you think is the best, or that provides you with the most fun. I will show you my list of spells, and do my best to explain the reasons why I think they are the most useful. 
hopefully you are able to obtain inspiration from when you're making your own list. Let's take a look. In this build, we use all 10 of our memory slots in order to maximize the amount of spells that we can have attuned. As mentioned before, the objective is to have a list that would allow us to be prepared for the many situations that the game can present us. Each spell has a use, and they each shine as an answer to a specific problem. The list of spells that I like to use is as follows. Gavel of Haima, Carrion Piercer, Frenzied Burst, Black Flame Ritual, The Flame of Frenzy, Litany of Proper Death, Freezing Mist, Eternal Darkness, Heal, and Flame Cleanse Me. Let's start with the Gavel of Haima and the Carrion Piercer. This is what I like to call the melee couple. The objective with these spells is to provide decent damage while in close quarters combat, but most importantly, they produce a knockdown. The Gavel of Haima knocks the enemy down by splattering them into the ground, while the Carrion Piercer flings them backwards. They also provide good AoE capabilities, with the Gavel being a circle from the point of impact and the Piercer being a straight line from the caster. These knockdowns provide us with additional opportunities for damage as the enemies get up, as well as very good stance damage that we can take advantage of with a critical hit. In fact, I like to use both of these because they combo extremely well. The combo I like to do is as follows. First, knock the opponent down with the Gavel of Haima. Then, immediately, cast the Piercer. These two spells will chain together in an almost seamless swift cast. And we can get a fully charged carry and piercer while the enemy gets up. Once the piercer hits, the enemy will be flung back and knocked down once again. This time, they are in perfect position for a fully charged R2 poke from our weapon. Once this connects, there is a very high probability that the enemy will be stance broken and we can go for a critical hit. The full combo does thousands of damage and it is perfect to deal with high priority targets at close range. I am sure that you are asking, why do I not just use the second attack of the Gavel of Haima instead of the Piercer? This is a good question. There are actually many reasons. First of all, a fully charged Piercer does more damage than the second attack of the Gavel. Second, the Piercer costs less FP than the second attack of the Gavel. And finally, the Piercer flings the enemy back, while the Gavel splats them down. This provides a better positioning for a perfectly meaty charged R2 from the Noble's Slender Sword. This is why the Gavel into Piercer combo is better than the double Gavel attack. Now, let's talk about the ranged trio. When I need to deal with threats from a distance, I like to use Frenzied Burst, Black Flame Ritual, and the Flame of Frenzy. The Frenzied Burst is my go-to for sniping targets. This incantation has the longest range of all the spells that we use. If we need to take care of an enemy before it gets to us, this is the answer. Not only this, but it is also a very good spell to pull enemies and separate them from each other. I have found that when you are in a situation where there are multiple enemies too close together and aggroing one of them would mean aggroing them all, it is easy to pull them one by one with frenzied burst. Thanks to its long range, you can target one enemy and have them chase you away from the others. This lets you take them down one at a time, which is much, much easier to do. As for the Flame of Frenzy, this is our general purpose multi-target option. If we are in a battle with multiple enemies, either at close or mid-range, the Flame of Frenzy provides multiple hits, high damage and fantastic stance damage to all enemies in front of the caster. It is worth noting that the spell's targeting is a bit volatile, meaning that some hits can miss their mark. This may lead to some enemies taking more or less damage than others, and sometimes this can create some issues with efficiency. That said, it does so much damage that simple enemies will almost never survive, and high priority targets will receive damage in the thousands. With this spell, the larger the enemy, the better for the caster. So, where does Black Flame Ritual come in? Well, this is the spell that brings the other two together. First of all, this is the Get Off Me spell, for when you need space to set up damage or to flee from the enemy. That said, this spell is an intricate part of the ranged combo that I like to use. 
this combo generates once again thousands of damage against targets that rush you down. Whenever you are fighting an enemy that does not have a lot of ranged options and will always run at you to attack, using this combo will zone them out while providing large amounts of damage. First of all, pull the enemy to you with Frenzied Burst. As they are running towards you, set up the Black Flame Ritual Wall in order to keep them from getting too close. While the wall is up, charge up a full Flame of Frenzy spell that will decimate the target. If the enemy is not defeated, there is a high probability that it will be stance broken, and that means that you can charge in for a critical attack. This is very effective to take care of high priority targets in a one-on-one -on -one scenario. All of this shows the importance of pulling enemies correctly. Litany of Proper Death is the perfect example of a spell that I do not use very often, but I am always happy to have when the situation arises. The fact that you have to double tap undead is very annoying, and this incantation provides an immediate response to this. When it comes to undead, Litany of Proper Death deals an incredible amount of damage, and it will surely one-shot any of the smaller undead mobs. Also, when it comes to the larger undead, it might not kill them with one casting, but it will still deal most of their HP in a single shot. Not only this, but the spell has considerable range and an advancing cone shape. This means that we can catch multiple enemies in one casting. As a result, this is a perfect answer for dealing with large groups of smaller undead, where the need to double tap them would generate issues alongside their large numbers. Remember, this spell straight out defeats undead enemies. No need to double tap them. Like I said, this might be one of the least used spells in my list, but I do not regret picking it, because I really do not want to waste time with undead enemies. Freezing Mist is a spell that surprised me. Initially, I did not think it was very good, but after I spent some time experimenting with it, I realized that it has great use for the sneaky mage. On paper, Freezing Mist creates an AoE effect that slowly inflicts the Frostbite status on enemies. That said, it has no effect on us. We do not get Frostbite from it. As such, one use is to drop the spell on top of yourself so that enemies will be inflicted with Frostbite as you fight them in close quarter combat. But, in my opinion, there is a better use for it. I noticed that while the Freezing Mist is on top of the enemy, they do not aggro. They just stand there as if nothing was happening. Eventually, the mist will proc frostbite on the enemy and it will suffer the full effects of it. As we know, one of the most important effects of frostbite is that besides the damage that the enemy takes, it receives a debuff where all of its defenses are lowered by 20%. Taking into consideration this information, I like to sneak up on enemies and drop the freezing mist on their position. While the frostbite takes effect, I wait and prepare for attack. Once I see that the Frostbite procs, I begin my assault, taking advantage of the additional 20% damage that my attacks will do. Obviously, you can't do this against every enemy. You won't get the element of surprise every time. That said, when it is possible to do it, it is very powerful and a big boost to our character's damage. Eternal Darkness, much like when we spoke before about Litany of Proper Death, is a spell that does not get used often, but that carries great value when it is needed. It single-handedly shuts down most incoming spells, giving you time to breathe and plan a counter-attack. One of its best qualities is that, while it absorbs enemy spells, it has no effect on yours. This means that you can set it up to defend yourself while you use your own spells to pick off enemies one by one. Personally speaking, I really like the spell and I do not mind using a memory slot on it, even if it does not get a lot of use. It makes things so much easier when facing spellcaster that it basically nullifies them. I like to have some good options to counter certain things and mages are one of them. Trust me, things are a lot better when you are doing the shooting instead of being shot at. Heal is the only healing spell that I use. That said, its purpose is not exactly to heal myself. In fact, I use this spell for one thing and one thing only, to kill revenants. 
Revenants are one of the most powerful and annoying non-boss type enemies that you can find in the game. They deal incredible amounts of damage and are in constant motion and attack. They teleport around the area and, I am sure you know, have that one move where they hit you one million times with all of their limbs in succession. It is very difficult to fight them, but fortunately, if you do not let them get started on their offense, then they become much easier to defeat. In order to achieve this, we use heal. Revenants are very weak to holy damage, but also they are extremely weak to healing spells. If you cast a healing spell with an AoE and it catches the Revenant, they will take damage instead of being healed. The amount of damage they take is always the same, about 60% of their total HP. Two spells will always kill them, and since the first spell also staggers them, it is very easy to cast two of them back to back for the kill. Since the damage is always the same, I like to use heal because it costs the least FP of all of the AoE heals. If you execute this strategy correctly, then you will defeat the Revenant before it even has a chance to hit you. Flame Cleanse Me is one of the most powerful incantations in the game. It provides a fast, cheap way to get rid of poison and, most importantly, Scarlet Rot. This should always be in your list of spells. Scarlet Rot is extremely annoying, and so is Poison. This is especially harmful in Elden Ring, because due to the size of the game and all of the exploring that we do, having a damage over time debuff like Poison or Scarlet Rot is really bad for your resource management. Obviously, you also have the option of using items to remove these conditions, but I personally do not want to deal with the crafting system and gathering materials. Flame Cleanse Me is always there and available to support you. At only 12 faith requirement, it is too good to pass up and there is no reason to not use it in every build that you make. The last two things I want to focus on are the Flask of Physics and the Rune of the Demigod. In this build, both of these factors are extremely important, especially for solo play. Allow me to begin with the Flask of Physics. For this build, there are actually a few options that we can take advantage of. You can use the Magic Shrouding Crack tier, the Fire Shrouding Crack tier, the Lightning Shrouding Crack tier, and the Cerulean Hidden tier. The different Shrouding Crack tiers will increase your Magic, Fire, and Lightning damage by 20% respectively. Depending on what sorceries and incantations you use, you pick the one that benefits your damage type. And then, the Cerulean Hidden tier will remove all FP consumption for 15 seconds. This means that, for these 15 seconds, all of your spells will be free of charge. When you're setting up your Flask of Physics, you will need to see what is more useful to you. You can increase one damage type and get free spells for a little bit, or you can increase two damage types. Personally, I prefer to increase my magic and my fire damage because they are my most used damage types. Free spells are nice, but I prefer the extra damage on all of my options. On the other hand, when it comes to the runes of the demigod, I fully recommend that you use Radon's rune. When activated, this particular rune will increase our HP, FP, and stamina, each by a total of 15%. This is perfect for the build because it increases both our offensive power through additional FP to cast more spells and our defensive power by increasing our max HP, allowing us to survive stronger hits. With this rune, this build will have a total of 2,454 HP, 228 FP, and 121 stamina, capable of both dealing large amounts of damage and surviving more than a few blows this rune completes our Omnicaster and readies it for battle. While making this build, I have found that there is a lot of value in what it offers. Capable of using most sorceries and incantations in the game, this character can give you an answer to everything. There is an argument to be made in which this build tries to do too many things, and that means that it does not do anything at full potential. While I can understand this, I do disagree with it. While the damage that our sorceries do is a little bit lacking, the damage that we get from incantations is definitely full power. So, as a result, I decided to use sorceries as the support 
getting different effects from them, like knockdowns and proccing frostbite, and then focus on the damage of the incantations. All of this is combined with high HP and FP values. We also cannot ignore that this build is not a glass cannon. It can take as much damage as it deals. What I like the most about this build is the large amount of options that it gives you. You can be whatever type of mage you want to be and you can focus on anything you want to focus on and all of these options would be equally good. And that, my dear viewer, is very powerful. Thank you very much for your time and I hope I get to see you on the next one.